If you have any questions for our speaker, please write them on the cards provided at your table and pass them up to me. I will ask as many as time permits. I'd like to introduce our head table guests now and briefly when their names are called. From your right, Norma Pace, member of the Board of Governors of the Postal Service. Uh, William Hickman uh, of the Public Policy Publishing Company and member of the Board of Directors of the National Press Foundation. Bill McAllister of the Washington Post. Tim Clark of Government Executive Magazine. Tracy Longo, Kipling Personal Finance Magazine. Greg Pierce, Washington Times. Michael Cochran, Deputy Postmaster General. Skipping over our speaker, Mark Johnson, Media General, News Service, Chairman of the Press Club Speakers Committee. William Henderson, Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President of the United States Postal Service. Claudia Cummins, Bloomberg Business News and member of the National Press Club Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon. Ken Eske of Scripps Howard News Service. Drew Von Bergen, National Association of Letter Carriers and past president of the National Press Club, and Lucretia Butler of the Nashville, Tennessee. I should tell you that this uh, is my first introduction as the new president of the National Press Club, and I must ask I'm embarrassed. I don't have a written introduction. The person who wrote it sent it to me by mail. <laughs> Ooh. So, so I guess I'll have to. Our guest today, Marvin T. Runyon, is the 70th Postmaster General of the United States. With a $50 billion budget, the post is second only to the Defense Department in terms of federal employment. General Runyon's two years at the helm of Postal Service has been far from serene. Undelivered letters stashed in warehouses, controversial stamps, long lines, poor service in the country's uh, post offices, shootings by former employees, and that's just outside the Beltway, where most Americans wait anxiously for their mail to be delivered. Here in the nation's capital, Republicans are out to privatize the service, leaving it up to more competition. General Runyon has been trying to cope with his problem by introducing private sector discipline to the activities of the Postal Service. He rocked the agency with many staff cuts, inducing 47,000 employees to accept buyouts. Those cuts, combined with continued complaints about service, have provoked cries of mismanagement and calls for his resignation. Nonetheless, General Runyon can point to significant successes. The Post Service reported a deficit of just $914 million last year, far less than the $2.4 billion some analysts had predicted. Moreover, he was able to postpone raised stamp prices until this year. The son of an auto mechanic, Mr. Runyon rose from assembly line worker at Ford Motor Company to a vice presidency. He's a graduate of Texas A&M University. He left Ford in 1980 to become the first employee at the uh, American manufacturing arm of Nissan Motor Corporation. In 1988, Mr. Runyon the auto industry altogether to run the federal government's Tennessee Valley Authority. It was there that he earned the nickname Ben Marvin for cutting the utilities bureaucracy by more than one third lives in Nashville with his wife, Sue Atkinson, and now the Postmaster General will tell us how he plans to improve the Postal Service. Mr. Renner. Well, I have to say you did pretty good with that introduction, uh, not having received that information. You'd almost think that you got it somehow. Um, Twenty-five years ago, the people of the country issued a mandate for change. Among the many problems of the late 60s, there was a breakdown in the mail system. The people said, fix it, and the Congress and the President took a bold step. They created the Postal Service, a new kind of organization. 
a government agency intended to run like a business. Today, the people have spoken again. They're demanding change. They want all of government more responsive, more accountable, and less expensive. They're telling the new Congress to fix it and fix it now. This afternoon, I want to talk to you about steps we need to take to keep the Postal Service the best and least expensive mail system in the world. The mail is important work. It's the way much of America communicates. People count on the mail to send and receive information. Businesses count on the mail to bring customers in the door and bring dollars to the bottom line. The mail is a basic right, a service guaranteed to everyone, everywhere, every day. Yet, at the same time, the mail is but one product in a very competitive marketplace. It's one of dozens of communication services for sale to businesses and consumers. It must come each day with the phone, the fax, the internet, and the FedExes and UPSs. The world. All things considered, we're doing remarkably well delivering this service product. We had some well-documented problems in some locations in 1994. The media and the residents in several major cities challenged us to improve our performance. And we're meeting that challenge. System delivery is up to record levels. Our finances are strong. More businesses ever are using the mail to do business. And it's working. Their profits are growing. Our performance is the best it's ever been, and we're determined to make it still better day by day. The credit for this improvement rightfully goes to our employees. They've done a great job responding to America's challenge. A lot about you and the mail. I'm talking about people like Evelyn Williams, the postmaster of Duncan Mills, California. It's a small community with a lot of senior citizens about 80 miles north of the Gate Bridge. It was in California towns overtaken by the recent flooding. When the water started rising, Evelyn had two choices try to save her home or try to save the mail. She didn't hesitate or look back. Even water carried away her furniture and keepsakes. She raced to the office, pick up the social security check, the Medicare payments, and the Christmas thank you notes from the grandchildren and took them to high ground. Despite the floods, the people of Duncan Mills were able to count on the mail and Evelyn Williams. Then there's Joe Procaccini, lawyer in Princeton, New Jersey. Joe's boss calls him the best mailman in Princeton. Everybody on the route knows and loves Joe, especially Dorothy Birch. She's got a good reason. On Saturday evening, she fell and broke her hip and couldn't move. No family members were coming over and no friends were stopping by to visit. I knew Joe would save me, she said to herself, and she waited patiently on the morning's mail. Every day I check on Dorothy, Joe says, I'll ring the bell or knock, you know, make sure she ate. Well, she's okay today, thanks to Joe Procaccini. Evelyn and Joe and 10 other postal heroes and hard workers singled out for recognition by America's media are here with us today. And I'd like them to stand at this time and be recognized. These people represent the best of who we are and what we can be. They remind us that 125 million addresses, one at a time, every day, consistently, carefully, is important, worthwhile work. They represent thousands of workers who take part in their community. Letter carriers who collected 31 million pounds of food last year for the needy. Mail handlers, mail carriers, and clerks who volunteer their time in nursing homes and in youth programs. And the full employees who gave $30 million to charity through the combined campaign in 1993 and even more in 1994. Proof that good news is news too. We recognize it's up to us to keep that good news coming. We have to make the world's postal system and we're working on it. For example, private sector companies use a Malcolm Baldrige award criteria to measure quality in their operations. 
We're applying the same yardstick to the Postal Service. We're evaluating our operations in over 100 locations across the country. Along with the mail, we're delivering innovative ideas. We're creating partnerships with private sector leaders to respond to marketplace needs and improve service. People want their elect mail to be as private and secure as the letters we deliver. With the help of some leading edge technology firms, we've developed an electronic postmark. It'll validate and safeguard messages backed by some of the toughest tampering laws in the land. And we'll soon have more to say about this new idea. And starting this evening, we'll begin testing a, a new one-two punch of electronic and hard copy mail. Working with major customers, we'll use our mail scanning equipment to notify business customers today that month's orders or last month's payment is on the way. This new product will help companies manage their cash flow and operation better and lower their costs. Evelyn and Joe and hundreds of thousands of other postal workers are hard at do, striving to do what we do a little better each day. But the people want more. Our has got to get better. A study by researcher Peter Hart shows that 85% of Americans consider their mail service to be reliable. Yet 39% see a wide gap between the goods they're getting and the excellent service they expect. They recognize what we in the poll service already know, that new ideas and major changes are necessary to help us achieve excellence, to get the mail in the box on time, every time, at the right price. When I came a half years ago, our customers mandate, run it like a business. They taught us my background with Ford and Nissan make the postal service the business-like public service envisioned in the Postal Reorganization Act. We've made changes. We've made progress. But there are problems that we can only use together. We've got a 70s law that isn't cutting it in the 90s. It gives us the responsibility, but not the authority, to deliver. We need to fix it, and fix it now. We're ready to work Congress, the administration, and the American people to build the Postal Service of tomorrow. To Let's get down to brass tacks. There are three areas of change we need to look at. People, prices, and products. Our first area of, of opportunity is our people. Evelyn and Joe and their fellow workers do a great job, particularly when you consider that they're dragging a the ball and chain. Rules, regulations, and red tape that hold them back from serving their customers. The problem starts collective bargaining, a process that the unions and management both agree is broken. As Jim Jellison, executive vice president for the Partial Shippers Association, says, the Postal Service has a large force in the country outside of the ferry, but it can't get a labor contract without a referee. Something's wrong. Jim's right. Three of the last five contracts had to be settled by outsiders who aren't accountable to postal customers. And we're headed there once again. Why? Arbitration laws discourage agreement by encouraging both sides to walk away from the table and pass the buck. We can fix our collective bargaining process and build a better labor management. With a process that works, management and unions can find common ground and develop solutions that work for employees and customers. There are other problems. We're stuck with work rules that don't work, that prevent employees from helping each other to serve customers. In a system that works, the unions and management can rewrite the rules together. We can make it simpler, not harder, for our people to do their job. Managers and employees alike are frustrated with our grievance system and our slow, complex processes. 65% of postal employees say we need a better way to deal with poor performers. We can simplify appeals and cut out some of the overlap. Employees need to have clear, quick, fair channels of redress. Compensation is tied to seniority and not performance. We need to encourage excellence. I'd like to send you pay, re rewarding employees for their best efforts. I want to create a system that works for the unions and the management, that helps us work together to come up with solutions that are fair to employees and customers alike. With help, we can do this. 
Then there are the federal laws that hamstring our ability to run the company and manage the force. One government agency tells us how to downsize. We do it. And two later, another government agency tells us we did it wrong and to do it over. It's time we had the freedom to manage this organization and get the mail delivered. With help from Congress and the administration, we can change all this and build a better postal service for the and 200 million states across the nation will collect the dividends in the form of better service at a lower price. That brings me to prices, the second area where we need fresh thinking and major change. Harry Buckle, publisher of Hard Hang Shopper in Brea, California, puts it this way. When you can't print products and services competitively, something is wrong and something has to be done. The postal rates us is little short of trench warfare. It pits product against product, customer against customer, presidential board against presidential board. Competitors look to raise our prices so they can raise theirs. And the whole process operates with little regard for the market. We spend tax money to deliver the mail. Your dollars keep those cards and letters. Yet your money doesn't always go back in the mailbox. Since 1985, the federal has taken $14 billion to help reduce the deficit. New assessments are up for discussion right now on the Hill. With help, there are several changes that we can make. We can streamline and simplify the writing process while still maintaining up the oversight. This way, we can raise prices when we need to, and better still, cut prices when we can. All the rewards could be great. With enough latitude, I believe one day it could become a profit center for the federal government. The third area of changes in our, frankly, much of our product line is stuck in the last century. In many cases, you pay what you're sending, not when you want it to get there. Postal regulations are still too complicated and weighty. If you stop to read the regulations on how to mail a letter, you may never get the letter mailed. Companies tell us the products. We want to respond to that need when customers need it. FedEx and UPS can offer volume discounts and do it quickly. We can't. You can bring a child in the world faster than we can price a new product and bring it to them. Tomorrow's postal system must have greater business independence and freedom to respond to the customer and the marketplace. With changes in the laws, we can get the pricing flexibility we need and the latitude to bring new products to market faster. Working with the Postal Rate Commission, we can reorient our products to focus on consistency, flexibility, and cons we can make it simpler and easier for customers to use the mail and for us to deliver. Some say the solution is to privatize the postal service. Well, that depends on what they mean. If it means putting for sale signs in our lobby windows and selling off the mail to the highest bidder, that's a bad idea. No private company accountable to Wall Street can carry out our national mandate. America needs a communication safety net that the Postal Service provides. And working together, we get stronger and more valid customers. On the other hand, if in freeing the Postal Service to become business-like and market-driven, we have something to talk about. Given the opportunity, we can outburst any competitor. This is not the time for hasty, piecemeal changes. It is the time for a thorough, thoughtful discussion of the act we can take to make the Postal Service more responsive and competitive in today's markets. Done right, change can benefit everyone, bringing improved service and lower prices. It could cut the communications lifeline we provide to the inner cities and rural regions of America and cripple the economy. We'll fight to keep that from happening. The Postal Service can deliver excellence to the American people. We can provide the mail service America wants, everyone, everywhere, every day, and continue to be one part of government that pays its own way. Evelyn and Joe and hundreds of thousands of postal employees are doing a great job despite laws and restrictions that hold them back. With change, we can do so much. We look forward to working with the leadership of our government, our customers, our unions, and our employees 
to deliver an organization that can deliver excellence in the next century. Thank you very much. specific as to what kind of a quasi-public-private corporation would be best for the, pub, uh, for the Postal Service? Well, I think what we need to do is to get into a dialogue with all of the people who are involved uh, and who will benefit from changes that we make in the Postal Service. Uh, I think that there are many things people, people have to say. We've had the one group that they've got a specific idea they want to do. We should consider that. But I need to consider everything that we're talking about, the way we deal uh, with all of the subjects that I talked about in, in the speech, the, the way we deal with our employees, the way we deal with our unions, the way we deal with the Postal Rate Commission, uh, the way we deal with our customers. Uh, I think everything is on the table that we have to sit down and talk about. I think we're, the mood is for change. And I think it's up to us to put everything on the table that we can talk about, talk about it and come up with a consensus. This really is a policy decision that we need to make. And it's a matter of public policy. It has to be determined, I think, by the Congress in the final analysis. The Republican contract with America also targets about $11.6 billion in budgetary savings by requiring the Postal Service to pre-fund its retirees' health benefits. That would be a cost to you and would lead to increased stances. What's your battle to defeat this measure? I hope it's better than the life plan we had. We've already paid $14 billion for this same purpose. Um, that's just uh, for the Obras that we've had. We've also had revenue foregone that we haven't received. So the number is even higher than $14 billion that we've already contributed. Uh, some people call this a stamp tax. Uh, the 11 points they're talking about now is then that uh, if, in fact, it comes in, we'll have to raise our rates. That's the only way we know to do that right now. Uh, and that's very, it'd be very unfortunate at this point in time because we're in the process of trying to go through uh, classification reform on, on all of the various mails that we deliver. Uh, there are a lot of people who've been involved in that, our customers, uh, and, and anybody who has an interest in it really want to happen. But if that were to pass, we would have to forego that for another year because we'd have to go in for a rate increase, and that would be very bad for the American public. I know for a fact they like it. We just put in a 10.3% in after four years, oh, pretty good, um, two points below the rate of inflation, and our customers like that, even though uh, inflation has set in in a lot of places, uh, college tuition up percent, uh, uh, coffee has gone up 47 percent, uh, you name it, things are going, we only went up 10.3 percent, but if we had to go up another 3 percent or 5 percent, I don't think the American public would like a stamp tax like that very much. Can you elaborate a little further on your thinking about replacing, uh, what would you recommend to replace arbitration in postal wage negotiations? Well, again, I think something that, that was decided on 25 years ago, uh, there have been a lot of suggestions. I'm not ready today to take a position on what we should do to solve that problem. I think that we all need to sit down and talk about it. Uh, when, um, when that was put in place, 25 years ago, uh, there were people that said, well, we just can't have a, another postal strike. I think we need to talk about everything that would be involved if we didn't have arbitration as it is now. We need to talk about other means of arbitration. Um, we need to talk about everything, put it all on the table and just sit down and, and have a real good conversation and come out with a decision that we know will work today and in next century for the Postal Service. Post of a share of potential class messages, C and T mail, is declining, though admittedly class volume is increasing. How does the service intend to get at this curve, apart from over $10 billion of debt 
while proposing decreases in the percentage ahead of third classes. That's a long shot. The fact is, um, what you say is true. We are losing uh, the financial and transaction mail. We lost 35 percent of, of that in the last um, five years. We expect to lose another probably uh, in the next five years. Uh, but the fact is, at the same time as that, we're getting mail in other categories. Our mail first uh, months of this year is up 4.7 percent over last year. And people keep looking at us and saying, well, you know, this select thing gets you. Well, the fact is, a um, long time ago when, they, when the telegraph came into being, um, they said that that was the end of the mail. And then the, the telephone, and by the way, uh, about 40 years later, our mail had 1,300 uh, percent. And then the telephone was invented um, several years ago, and they said that's the end of the mail. And, you know, about 25 years later, the mail had improved or increased by 1,200 percent. And uh, then along uh, came the, uh, the computer, I think it was around 1947, that uh, uh, Harvard and IBM said, we got a computer and it's going to work. And they said, okay, that's it. That's the end of the mail. Didn't, uh, 25 years ago, uh, there was a study given to Congress that said the mail will be gone, you know, in 20 years. Well, 20 years has passed, and our mail is twice as much as it was. Uh, so, you know, what we do is we go, we've got different markets. Uh, people are doing their business different these days. Uh, people are ordering by mail, they're not walking into stores, people are, are getting products by mail. So there are, there are other things that are taking the place of, of what you're talking about. So I don't see the end of the mail. I think we need to figure out how we're going to handle the volumes we're getting. And by the way, we did a really great job this Christmas handling mail. There were a lot of people that were very concerned this Christmas that we wouldn't be able to provide service to the, uh, the people who needed to make it. So what, we did, what did we do? Well, first we set up a, a national center so that we'd know what was doing all the time and whatever plant was doing. Uh, the result was that though we had a price increase coming on January 1st, and big mailers knew that and put a lot of mail forward, it's amazing to me how people that, that mail catalogs can figure out how to mail a log two months earlier for the business they expect two months later, but they're able to do it, and I, and I can for that. So they brought that in early, so we had all that extra mail, but it's the best Christmas that we've ever done, the volumes we've ever had, and we did a great job. And guess what? The mail is not dropping off now. We're continuing to increase in mail. In your remarks, you mentioned improving the rate setting process. What specific recommendations would you urge Congress to consider regarding the, the rate commission, the rate setting process? And you mentioned working with the Postal Rate Commission aren't part of the problem. No, I think we do need to work with the Postal Rate Commission. We need to work better with them than we have. And by the way, I'd like to commend the Postal Rate Commission because this light increase that we had, a rate increase like that takes 10 months. It takes us about five or six months to get ready, but it takes them 10 months to deliberate. They cut back on the time that they took because we asked them to do that so we could get an effect on January the 1st, and they did it. Uh, so they work with us. Uh, I've had meetings with them on our board, meetings with uh, the commissioners, and uh, we need to work with them. They've got some good ideas. We've got some good ideas. We need to work out the way we can best solve our problems. Is it time to consider organizing a new capital commission to address postal service competitive and viability? Well, I wasn't around when the capital commission was organized before, but that's what, 27, 28 years ago, I guess. Uh, I do think, though, that a lot of people in the postal community today who know about the mail system, they what's needed. I think that we need to get those people together, and, and we're beginning to do that, and let them work out what is the best way for us to handle a mail system. There has to be a base that we've got right now. I think the answers. Uh, we've got a lot of groups that say, well, this would work or that would work, and, and it may, but we need to get all of those together. And I think we have people that understand that, that, that I think they can do that, and I think we should try that first.
you've mentioned uh, transforming the postal service. You've talked about uh, reducing the number of postal employees. What did the last attempt at restructuring postal service teach you to avoid uh, a, comp uh, a note? You now have more employees payroll than after the first restructuring. Of course, you got apples and oranges. Um, the first restructuring taught me was that we really need to talk to every federal agency in this city before we go do something. Because as I, we did follow what um, one of the agencies said, the Office of Personnel Management, we talked to them, what we're doing, is this the right way, and so forth. And we followed it you know, to the letter, and we did it. And in fact, we've got another organization that says, you did it wrong, so you've got to do it over again. Uh, just yesterday, <laughs> uh, we were talking about this situation, and it looks like that and through this thing, we may lose um, half of the management that's in place uh, to their subordinates. You know, they just kind of change places. Uh, that's going to be a little different. Uh, but I think that the, the first restructuring that we did really accomplished a lot of things. It saves a billion dollars a year, say the American public, a billion dollars a year in cost. And I think that's important because it's continuing on. Uh, that we've got more people on means that we're very successful in uh, selling our product. Uh, the number of people that we have now that we've added uh, are much less the amount that the product would have said we should have added, and we've done that by improved productivity. So the that we're higher than we were two years ago is not indicative of whether the restructuring worked or didn't work. What it is indicative of is we're improving our performance so much that people are bringing us more product, and it takes more people. We have new routes added. You have to have new letter carriers. And you have to have new post offices go in place and those hands. I think we're doing very well. Would it be your budget to get rid of second class mail? Well, here we're piecemealing this again, you see. I think we need to look at everything that we've got. We may be that there's some section uh, of our mail or some part of our mail that we might not should have. If we do, then I think that's what we need to do. But I'm not, I'm not ready today to talk about any particular class or, or what we should add. Well, we have a bunch of suggestions for <laughs> you. <laughs> hey, we all love suggestions. Yeah, that's okay. what we're asking for. Uh, stamp machines in those stations help to shorten lines. Work. Right. Yeah. What about a more aggressive repair program. And I'll give you a second one. You can take both of them. Uh, it's the second and succeeding ounces of first class mail cost 23 cents. Why not offer 23 cents in, book in booklets, especially in vending machines that work? Got it? That's a pretty good idea. Uh, I think that might be a really great idea because usually we make money when we sell in quantities because people never use everything they think they're going to use. And what better way to make money than buy stamps and not use them? Uh, on, the, on the vending machines, though, on the machines and their repair, of those added people that we have, it's over 1,200 of them, are, are um, uh, technicians who are to help us get those vending machines in better shape. We know we got a problem there, and we're working very hard to fix it. We're replacing a lot of our vending machines. A lot of them are too old. We need to get them out of there and get the next generation of machines in place. Let's uh, go to some stamps now, all right? Who exactly ever thought it was a good idea to put a mushroom cloud on a stamp? <laughs> I'm really glad you asked that question. <laughs> it was over 10 years ago that uh, somebody got the idea that we should, <clears throat> should recognize the fact that we, we had World War II, and we should identify events that should be recognized. And so we put together um, our, our stamp advisory committee, the Department of Defense, who was very involved in all of that. Um, the State Department was also very involved in all of that. And we, we put a committee together of those people, and they identified the subject. 
and then they passed on the the figure we're going to use the pictures and so forth we're going to stamp so those are all approved by them before we ever start so you know a lot of people were involved a lot of people don't want to admit it today but the and they all approved those stamps before they ever went to press we've got a bunch of them wanted to know some of your thinking about eliminating the Christmas stamp reversing your decision and what does that mean for the future is it here to stay or what well that wasn't the first year they decided not to have a Madonna we always have Christmas stamps it's a Madonna that that really the issue to head we had had a Madonna for five years there were years before that we do Madonna we had I think we had George Washington on but we had two or three other people on stamps and they thought our committee thought this should be nice to have this angel instead of a Madonna and so we did that when we announced amps I got cards and letters which by the way makes money for us but but I did get a lot of cards and letters about that and we thought about it and decided that you know we're not doing this thing right and you know what's the problem I have a Madonna we haven't used up all the things that the most made because all the Madonna's are our artwork from the masters and we hadn't used it up so we might as well go ahead we're gonna have an angel and a Madonna this year and for the future I think as long as I'm postmaster general it's gonna be a month back to your competition fax machines are being as common as phones in many offices does the Postal Service have an estimate of how much business it loses to fax machines well the the fax machines that we know about the business that's a 35 percent we're talking about that that's fax and email and and all of those types of things so actually we've lost about 35 percent that's not all the facts large portion of that is to fax and you know you can't fight the facts I use the facts I use it when I want something right now we don't have a service in the Postal Service that does that and so it's good and we're not fighting it but we're gonna replace it with something else a member of our audience feels that postal work seem proud of their dress anymore some look almost like street people does the Postal Service have any dress code regulations or any yeah I think we have dress regulations and maybe we should change the uniform or the wearing apparel you know I changed the logo and I don't know whether whether we could satisfy everybody if we means the wearing apparel but yeah we do have we do have dress codes I think all of our our letter carriers wear a uniform or are supposed to wear a uniform we have some contract carriers on rural routes who do not wear a postal uniform so that may be what you're addressing too why is the postal monopoly on addressed first and third class mail in the public interest well that's another piecemeal question as I see it I think we need to address all of the things that that have been brought up you mentioned second class and third class and I thought we need to put all of those things on the table and talk about them and I think that we can come up with solutions that will please not everybody but I think we can get a consensus opinion on what we should be doing in the Postal Service and then we need about to do it under reclassification the Postal Service will start offer a pop audition rate that is a discount for non pre-sorted coded mail what well that's not something that we're going to offer in the case that we're going forward also rate commission at this time it's something that we can consider for the next year when we go into a further reclassification we're not going to get all of the reclassification done at one time 
uh, mainly because we have to get a lot of, of information about how this is going to affect us t before we can go forward to the Postal Rate Commission. And uh, we don't have that into that particular subject, so I think that it's something that we have to work on and, and look at later. There have been several questions asking how you justify spending the bucks, this one of them says, on advertising, telling us in the District of Columbia how good our postal service is when most of us who live here think otherwise. Well, you know, we had people telling us how bad the postal service was, and we thought we ought to counter that just a little bit. Uh, we did do a lot of things in Washington. We added a lot of, of uh, people in Washington. Uh, we changed a lot of facilities. We've added a lot more stamp machines uh, in, this, in this area. We've cleaned up our retail lobbies. Uh, we're getting better overnight service. Uh, we're up uh, about uh, 20 points over what we were when it was bad. Uh, we're nearly as high as it's ever been in Washington, and I imagine that probably in the next report we get it's going to be higher yet. And so I think we've done a good job of cleaning up our act in Washington. And we wanted to let people know that. A lot of times people just don't, don't know that. They, they read about the bad things, and, and we think that if you want the good things published, we may have to advertise it. Back on the facts, uh, you said you don't have a fax product, nah. but uh, lines of customers are paying two or dollars a page to fax material through some private company. Would you consider a similar service for less money as a new revenue source? Well, we're looking at a lot of new products. Uh, this electronic uh, superhighway maybe opened the way for us to do something more. I mentioned having a, uh, a postmark, electronic post uh, We think that uh, as time goes on, partnering with other people in that business, uh, we can come up with a system that uh, I think might fill the need that these people who are paying two dollars, I don't think they would have to pay that much. So I think that uh, we need to keep looking at wooing and, and uh, we'll tell you about that as we move along and get a product. And we'll advertise it. Uh, this one comes friend. Uh, <laughs> the new president of the press club was pretty tough on you. How would you describe reporting about the post office today? Well, that's tough. We have a lot of reporting about the post office today. I don't know how many thousands there are, but uh, we get uh, press clips from all around the country. And uh, there's good news and there's bad news uh, that we get in those clips. We've got a little uh, symbol that we put on the good news that says good news. And uh, we, we have about as many of those as we have the other kind. So I think that uh, all told, uh, we do very well in the medium. One of the problems that we have as a postal service, I mentioned several things in your <coughs> brief introduction about, about things. Um, and you mentioned violence in there. Now the fact is with over 700 and 30,000 employees, it's quite possible that one man might get mad at another man and they might both work at the Postal Service and there might be something happen. If it happens and they work for the Post Office, you can believe that that's a nationwide story. If two people work at uh, Joe's Grill and they get in a fight, somehow it doesn't make the headlines like the Postal Service does. So. I think that there's a lot of reporting on the Postal Service on one-of-a-kind type things uh, that happen that gets nationwide coverage. And, you know, for example, in Chicago, we had three things happen, really bad things. They shouldn't have happened, but they did. We had a carrier uh, who was a casual employee for three months, hadn't delivered her mail, threw it over a viaduct, and and the homeless person burned it. That was bad. Had another carrier that for 10 years had saved some of their mail, for what purpose, I don't know, put it in sacks, put it in their basement, 
Then they retired from the service three years ago and moved from that house, asked their neighbor if they would put that those sacks in their basement, and they said, yeah, they would. And then that neighbor moved and put the stuff out on a vacant lot, and it was found. Okay, those stories were nationwide stories. Maybe they should have been. I don't know if, you know, if Joe's Grill would have got a nationwide story over something like that with an employee or two employees, but we did. And that nationwide story affects us. It affects our employees really drastically. When that happens, our employees, not that bad. We had, we had a couple of bad, those bad people will end up going to jail because they'll be prosecuted for that. They can't do that kind of thing. And, but it does happen. So I think that, that we get good coverage. Uh, I think that w our name recognition is so big that we can expect coverage on almost anything that happens, and we get it. Well, before we uh, get to the final question, I uh, have a few things for you. First is a certificate of appreciation. Thank you for appearing with us today. Secondly is a National Press Club mug, which you can either use to drink coffee out of or solicit funds to reduce the deficit. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I may uh, use it for the latter purpose of drinking coffee. Yeah. <laughs> uh, our last question now is fish stamps. Now, what's your personal preference? The old Elvis or the new? Well, actually, it's the new Elvis uh, because it's been proven that it's a, a given success, and so I couldn't go any other way. Now, if I thought about it from a standpoint, the old Elvis, you know, it might be okay, and we might ought to go back and look at the old Elvis one more time. Thank you all for coming.